OK, um, in, the, in this session, I'd like us to discuss and debate and apply um, a process to support managing innovation. So previously, we've looked, for example, at um, how we might develop and apply an innovation strategy. But this is more at the um, operational level. So how might we develop and apply a process that supports innovation? Terribly important because when you go into an organization that wants to encourage innovation, they don't really know where to start. Do you start with people and creativity? Do you start with the environment and the climate? Do you start with certain tools and techniques that purport to improve innovation? You know, where do you begin? So the process is a, a good way of trying to structure the application of innovation to real organizations. And we'll use the Phillips case study, which I hope you had a chance um, to digest, and we'll discuss that in groups later and then back in class. So, familiar slide. <laughs> the, um, the plan, as usual, is to have a, a discussion, hopefully a bit briefer than sometimes. So we want to allow good time to analyze a case study, because it's quite a significant case study. So we'll begin by discussing what we know, or think we know, about um, developing and applying a process to support innovation, and we'll discuss some, some applications and some limits. Um, we're going to argue that this is an inherent way of embedding good practices, um, because much of the research doesn't sort of percolate itself down into management practice. Um, there was a, uh, an economist uh, seminar recently down, 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 where are we now, across at Oxford Side School of Business a few weeks back, where a colleague, Clay Christensen from Harvard, was making the point that even the top US journals basically talk to themselves, the business journals. They don't talk to people in practice, and therefore it's hard to influence and improve practice. So um, they gave the example that the top, I think it was the top six or seven US business journals, how many times they are subsequently cited in other research, and it was um, uh, six or seven times. So a very low impact in terms of, you know, people do research, they publish it to their peers, and they go on and do some more research. And as a result of that, it's sort of quite a sort of airtight system, even in business research, trying to get good practices out and also trying to identify good practices beyond our research. So uh, as with the other sessions, part of the purpose is to um, distill what we think we know about practices in, into a framework or model that, that's more tractable, amenable to practice. So that's really a core idea. So the process idea is really trying to distill what we think we know about good practice, and then we're going to apply that uh, in the example of case study of Phillips Lighting. Hi. So the case study is interesting from a range of perspectives, but as I said before, the uh, purpose is not really to look at the case study and, and to make big insights into good or bad practice in isolation, but to apply the framework to the case and to try to understand what they did well and that therefore may be generalizable, but also to be more critical with things that maybe they didn't do so well or they didn't do at all. And I think it's an interesting real case that we can then get some traction to use that framework, try to identify uh, under what conditions good practices work and also some of the limitations of those good practices in terms of universal application. And the so what, the takeaway is, is to try to identify a set of um, tools that flow from that innovation process at different sort of uh, phases of the process, what types of methods or tools might work best, and we'll talk about that in abstract, but also in the concrete example of Philips Lighting. So that is the plan, okay? So um, why do we need a process? Well, it's one of these things that's perhaps inherently unmanageable. We suggested before that probably less than half of the measurable performance of organizations can be attributed to innovation, strategy, and management. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. But nonetheless, there is a measurable large proportion of performance that we can attribute to innovation. So the argument, therefore, is that we need some way of managing it better. OK? Mysterious voices. Um, the most simple process is, um, is the one up, up on front. A health warning here, if you see a slide or a book or a consultancy pitch that has a light bulb on it, ask for your money back. 
Yeah, because it's probably the worst and most misleading um, metaphor that can be in the world, and it's a good example that people still think in terms of that eureka moment. Yeah, um, we discuss the moments and the limitations, but the simplest model you'll get is going to get some sort of idea, the light bulb moment, and then some sort of ill-defined steps, and ba you know, some sort of success. Okay, I ask you, what are the problems with that very simple model? And models are important. If you look at practice and behavior, they're often driven by simple mental models. Yeah? We tend to simplify things to make decisions and take actions. So models are important. They're not just some academic sort of backwater. They really do influence behavior, investments, decisions, and such like. So having poor models leads us to very bad decisions. Okay? So what do you think are the limitations, plural, with that most simple of models? Or perhaps you don't, in which case we'll have an early tea break. No, that's not an option. What do you think is wrong with that very simple model? It gives an impression that if you follow A to B to Z, you know, you'll get to the, the right answer. But it's, yeah. It doesn't give you a yeah. feedback. No, it, gives a, it, it, gives a, it puts a lot of emphasis on that initial brilliant idea, and much less detail about what actually happens subsequently. It's almost automatic. Yeah? You sort of develop the thing and then success or not. So perhaps the emphasis as we'll see shortly, is actually um, dysfunctional. We tend, therefore, to put our resources and efforts in the wrong place, would be one argument. Any other limitations do you see of that particular model? It's a bit too straightforward. Um, in real life, from an idea, from an innovation to, to success, it's actually it's, it's in a cycle and it's fuzzy. It's not as clear and straight as the, the, the model seems to show it. Yeah. Reality is a lot messier, isn't it? I mean, particularly in terms of uh, innovation. So there are feedback loops, there's dead ends, lots of dead ends. Um, there's lots of cycles going back, retrying, experimenting, trial and error and such like. So again... The idea can be fairly useless and you have to, you, you discard it and you can get you start from scratch. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's actually a separate problem, is it puts so much emphasis on, on the original idea and, and therefore by proxy that creativity is synonymous with innovation. And our argument will be, actually, it's a very tiny part of innovation. And actually, too much emphasis on idea generation, creativity, is, is again, dysfunctional. So certainly, there's two weaknesses there. It sort of takes away the reality of these feedback loops and these trials and errors and such like. Yes? It's putting the whole emphasis for success on the idea. Yeah. The quality of the idea is paramount. Um, what was the, um, who, who was the American writer who was going about there? If you build a better mousetrap, they will beat a path to your door. Who was that? You're showing your weak educational background but not known either. So. Um, anyway. <laughs> anyway, the idea was, you know, an inherently good innovation, a good idea will flourish. Um, as we've seen in other sessions, that's not the case. And the counter argument also is that many things that are very commercially successful aren't terribly innovative necessarily and can not often be identified from a, a focal idea or a concept. Often they're a combination of disparate ideas and concepts, and that's uh, not also captured by that. Any other limitations? Quite a few at the moment. Yeah. So the success is vague. I mean, what is the success? Either market share or profit or, uh, I mean... In, in yeah, the... true. It's very unclear about what does success mean. Does it mean technical success, commercial success, growth, profitability, social utility? And all these things are different and not synonymous. You can have something that's technically uh, successful, in fact, um, one of the studies we did several years ago, you find that winning a technical award, particularly um, a, a national one, is an indicator of subsequent commercial failure. Yeah? Because the things judges look for are almost counter-opposite to what are, are the routes to commercialisation. So it's a bit like Dragon's Den. Yeah? If you're able, it's best to invest in the ones they don't because they're more likely to be successful. Um, because you often look for different things. Yeah? So you're right, technical success is different to commercial success. It's different to social utility or benefit. Yeah? So being clear about what, what we're trying to achieve through the innovation is terribly important. Because different flavours of innovation lead to different outcomes. Any other weaknesses? It shows that everything is controllable. <coughs> It is, yeah, it's quite a closed model in the sense it's a management model in the sense that you get the idea yours or somebody else's and you manage it to, to a sort of market success. Yeah, certainly it overstates the amount of managerial control we might have. Any other? It's pretty poor. 
<coughs> well, I have got the right slide. Oh, I thought it's my slide. <laughs> I'm criticise my own slide. Give the idea you can only have innovation when you have a brilliant idea. Don't really take it to. Yeah, I mean that goes back. Yeah, that's a slightly more, more sophisticated argument. We said already that it puts too much emphasis on the original idea, and that's unrealistic. But the counter to that is your point is that often um, the source of innovation are not necessarily ideas, and they're not necessarily at the beginning of the process. People stumble around, and sometimes it's in other parts of the process that they get an idea for connecting something up. So it's not simply that it's too linear. It's also that the sources of innovation are many, and many at different points. So it's a pretty lousy model. Yeah, but nonetheless, light bulbs proliferate and arrows proliferate everywhere. Now, again, if it were just a sort of <laughs> academic debate, and we had these strange things outside the academic world, when people say that's academic, they mean it's trivial. Yeah, in the university sector, when people say that's academic, we think, oh, you mean very rigorous, very rigorous. <laughs> and so you have this counter sort of thing between common sense. So it, it's an academic debate in the sense it's the sort of thing researchers get, get um, excited about in terms of the sources of innovation. Okay, so it's a lousy model, but nonetheless, it influences behavior. It's often explicit. Yeah, in the jargon, it's a heuristic. It's something that we think, yeah, we're inherently looking for novelty and good ideas and how we might manage it. Yeah, and that's only a tiny part of it. Yeah? So we need to broaden the sources and understand the process more than simply the, the inputs there on the left-hand side. But also to understand what are we trying to achieve from it? Now, how do we measure success? Is it technical success? That could be legitimate. We could be an organization that generates technologies and we don't commercialize, maybe we just license it, in which case the metric is technical success. But in many other instances, there's either a commercial or a social goal that we're trying to achieve. Okay. Okay, so we need something better than that. Um, however, if we go, if we simply map reality, we have the opposite problem. Yeah, if you map real innovations, there are all these loops and iterations that you pointed out. There's dead ends, there's feedback loops, there's recurse, recursion before you move on. It's, it's a mess. And you can try to understand that on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's very hard to generalise. So somewhere between simplistic and misleading, which is what the problem is, and simply describing the, well not random, but the mess of reality. We need a sort of, not halfway house, but we need something that extracts the essence from what is manageable from what isn't, and what is in the manageable part actually makes a difference to the outcomes. So we need to be able to differentiate that. So there's a bunch of things that aren't manageable, in which case we need to put them on the side. But there's a bunch of things that we know empirically make a difference, and that's where we should put our attention and effort. Okay, so we can't pretend to manage it all, but we can manage the things that we know we can influence the outcome from. Okay, and there are many, many, many processes, models, um, and they come and go. And we sort of gravitate between making it more or less um, complex. But we don't have any light bulbs. But what we do have is some graphical limitations. So before we move through this, the graphical limitation is, and this is when you get other people to draw your diagrams for you, you sort of do a brief on a napkin and it comes back and say, no, that's not what we meant. And you say, no, this is what we meant. It goes back and it's not what we meant. And the third iteration, the publisher says you've run out of money, so that's going to get published. Uh, that's basically where we are. So what it, what it isn't, okay, what it isn't is, but what, it's what it looks like, is a linear, so yeah, like the light bulb one. We didn't ask for that, but they put it on. Okay. Earlier versions had lots of feedback loops, but then it started to confuse everybody about what, does that feedback loop go to that phase or that phase or that phase, just to demonstrate that there are those recursions, okay? So it has loops. What does it do then? It does two things. One, it differentiates the context, what we're gonna call the context, from the process. And that's really important. We find in practice when you go into organizations, they get in these Nazi cycles about, is the problem that we don't have a strategy, or is the problem the organisation doesn't support it, or is the problem we don't have a process or tools? And so you need to step back and isolate what the problems or challenges are. Yeah? So one way is to relieve or put into relief the process from the context in which it's embedded. Yeah? So